really happy to introduce the next panel. The next panel is one that's very clo close to my heart. These are some of the people that we've already talked to who have already shared data with the RDC ADAPT platform, um, who are re real pioneers in helping us move the, move this platform forwards. Um, this, pa this panel has four, four people on it. We're gonna, we're, um, they'll each speak briefly about why they've de uh, decided to be pioneers, why they've decided to work with us to make this, um, this platform a reality what concerns they may have had about sharing data and how we've addressed them. And then we'll go into a panel discussion with these people. So I, I'll start by introducing Nuria Carrillo, who's the Chief Medical Officer at the Neuromuscular Disease Foundation now. She was previously at NIH and worked on a natural history study for GNE myopathy. So Nuria, over to you and thank you very much for helping us with this platform so early on. Good afternoon. I first want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this workshop to share my experience sharing data with the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator. Uh, as Jane mentioned, I'm a physician scientist and for the last 10 years I was principal investigator at the NIH where among other things I conducted natural history studies and clinical trials for rare genetic diseases at the NIH Clinical Center. Uh, earlier this year, I became um, and moved into a different uh, position as part of a rare disease foundation. And so I'm excited to find the bridge between uh, academia and uh, rare disease foundations. So today I am going to talk about my experience sharing data from our natural history study of GNE myopathy which we shared earlier this year with RDCI. Uh, GNE myopathy is an extremely rare and slowly progressive genetic muscle disease. And before the start of our natural history study at the NIH in 2011, there was only case reports in the literature about the disease. And at that time, clinical trials were being planned but there was no uh, information to guide the design of clinical trials. So we decided to start uh, a prospective longitudinal natural history study to fully characterize the disease, determine the disease progression, and identify suitable clinical outcome measures and potential biomarkers. So this information could be used to understand the disease better and also to support uh, clinical development programs. Uh, the study evaluated patients from all over the world uh, for a period of uh, almost 10 years, and we obtained very detailed clinical, medical, family history, phenotype, and genetic information. We also obtained longitudinal data using a battery of clinical outcome measures, because at that time we didn't know what outcome measures might be appropriate and sensitive in this patient population. So we tested a variety of them, including quantitative muscle strength, a variety of performance functional measures uh, that were in use, such as the six minute walk test, the time up and go, and then other NIH developed measures such as the adult myopathy assessment tool. We also uh, obtained a battery of patient reported out outcomes and skeletal muscle uh, MRI and spectroscopy. So overall, you can see this was a very extensive natural history study. Overall, each vis visit lasted four to five days for the patients. Uh, bottom line is we collected a lot of data. Um, and from the beginning, we knew that it was very important that this data eventually be shared with the scientific community, uh, with uh, pharmaceutical companies that were interested in, in developing uh, potential drugs, and also uh, in general to make it publicly available. And the reason for this, as Jane mentioned before, is natural history studies, especially for rare diseases that are not well characterized, are very useful in drug development. Uh, for clinical trials, they help identifying a patient population, select appropriate clinical outcome measures, and design your clinical trial in a way that they are appropriately powered to measure treatment effect. 
Uh, unfortunately, we know that many trials that fail may be because they are underpowered. And so the use of natural history data to understand all the variables leading to power calculation is really critical in clinical development programs. Uh, but also because natural history studies require a significant time commitment and significant resources, uh, we believe they should be a shared resource. They are expensive and they can be expensive and, and lengthy. And in the field of rare diseases where resources such as patients, money, and time are limited, it is very important that if somebody has collected natural history data that they make it publicly available. Uh, and, um, you know, because these data should belong to the scientific and the patient community and benefit uh, and have the ability to benefit any clinical development program for that particular disease. Uh, and in, in RDCA, we found uh, the ideal platform to make our data available to the rare disease community. And, and we hope that we can contribute to help accelerate uh, drug development for g and &E myopathy. And potentially, um, it could also be useful for other uh, rare and slowly progressive muscle diseases. Um, anyway, so that is, um, we have, we've had a great experience. And I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy um, to receive any questions by email. Um, now I am going to introduce our next speaker, who is Julie Raskin, the Executive Director at Congenital Hyperinsulinism International. Over to you, Julie. Hi, thank you so much, Doria. And I wanna thank uh, RGCA DAP, CPAP and Nord for the opportunity to be here today and to be part of this discussion. Uh, it's really, really wonderful. So thank you. So I am the executive director of Congenital Hyperinsulinism International. I'm also a rare disease mom. Uh, my 24 year old son was born with congenital hyperinsulinism. And congenital hyperinsulinism is a disease that causes the overproduction of insulin resulting in severe hypoglycemia. And the brain and the body need sugar to grow and develop. So this is a very serious, terrible disease because it can cause brain damage and death. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So our organization, G for short, supports HI research for better treatments and cures, raises awareness of HI to reduce brain damage and death and improves access to care and treatments for those with HI while providing a community for HI families. And the disease is truly so hard to live with and there's so much unmet need because the parents of children with this disease spend so much time focusing on feeding their child and measuring blood sugar levels to avoid brain damage each and every single day. So for that reason, one of the big projects that we have at CHI is the HI Global Registry. And this is a patient powered research project that we developed to generate new insights into HI for the people who live with it. So that the parents of those who live with it uh, and the adults can go in and learn more about the disease and understand it themselves. But also equally important and so important for the families is to support the success of HI clinical trials and other research for treatment and cures. And so we have really thought about how best can we do this? And our HI Global Registry is a collection of 13 different surveys. And over time, these longitudinal studies become a, um, a natural history study. But our data set is patient powered and it's from the patient. And to be really, really valuable, connecting with other data sets, data sets from industry, data sets from academics is very, very important uh, to us because the whole picture will emerge when we share and harmonize the data. So it's, it's really, really important to us to do that. So that brings us to why, why did we join the RDCA 
uh, DAP. And it's really so that we can harmonize this data so that the patients, the caregivers, the biotechs and pharma, and the researchers at the academic institutions can all come together. And all of this data can then be harmonized and be useful to the regulatory authorities. And our disease is so awful that we want, we want a better future and we want it as soon as we can possibly have it. And so if we sit siloed with our data by ourselves and don't add it and contribute, then it's for naught. And it's really because the patients have put in so much themselves by adding their data to our project that we value their contribution. And to make their contribution all the more valuable, we needed to add it to other data sets. So we were just thrilled when we saw that um, this wonderful project was coming to fruition and we wanted to be a part of it. Uh, we had a lot of qualms about, um, about sharing and we worked through, through those concerns with uh, CPATH and with NORD and they were very, very responsive to our concerns. And, and we understand the concerns of the patient community. So uh, we, we really want other groups, we hope other groups come in and participate. We certainly hope others within the congenital hyperinsulinism world become a part of this. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited about the discussion that will come come after our other wonderful panelists speak. And I'm really excited now to introduce Steve, Steve Roberts, who's the Chief Scientific Officer at the Tuberous Sclerosis Foundation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Julie. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. And I also want to add my thanks to CPATH and NORD for the invitation to participate in this, this really important and informative meeting today. So uh, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at the Tuberous Sclerosis Alliance, where I've been for nine years. Uh, before that, I spent 16 years in the pharmaceutical industry in research at Upjohn, Pharmacia, and Pfizer. Um, and so, you know, the, the thought of sharing data with um, a large consortium, especially that involves researchers, lots of different diseases, industry, um, was was very attractive. Um, and I, I think the next uh, few minutes will, will hopefully help you see why. So to put help you understand sort of where we're coming from, I wanted to give a very brief introduction to the disease, tuberous sclerosis complex. This is a genetic disorder caused by uh, mutations in one of two genes, either TSC1 or TSC2, um, that causes tumors to grow in, in various organs throughout the body, uh, but most commonly the brain, eyes, heart, kidney, lungs, and skin. Um, but in addition to tumor growth, which tends to be slow growing, not rapidly malignant like when we think of, um, uh, of cancers, um, the neurological manifestations that come along with TSC tend to be the most devastating. So uh, about 85% of people with TSC experience epilepsy and about two thirds of them are refractory to treatment. So there's a huge unmet need in the seizure uh, side of things. And about 50% of people with TSC fall on the autism spectrum. Um, we estimate that uh, TSC affects about one in 6,000 6, live births. There are some pretty good uh, epidemiology studies on that. So that leads to an estimate of about 50,000 people in the U.S. and maybe a million worldwide. But interestingly, no two people are affected in the same way, not even identical twins, although, you know, not surprisingly, they're going to be more alike than unrelated individuals. Uh, and I don't have time to get into that, but it has to do with the genetics of an autosomal recessive uh, disease that's also a, a tumor suppressor uh, syndrome, and it leads to, leads to that type of variability. Our natural history database um, is a little bit different than some that you've heard about before in that the data are collected at clinics around the country, not entered from um, patients or family members living with the disease. Our natural history database was started back in 2005 and launched in 2006, so it's been around quite a while. We have over 2,200 participants. Um, and the data are updated at least once annually at 18 different TSC clinics around the country. Um, recently, in the last couple of years, the TS Alliance has begun to add um, and enroll 
uh, people to participate in the natural history database ourselves to help increase the diversity so that we're not capturing just those people who are going to these um, you know, very um, expert centers, if you will. We want to be able to capture data from um, people uh, across the United States. Since uh, 2009, when we had enough data to start getting data requests, we've had 70 requests for data. Um, and these have led to at least 10 peer-reviewed publications. And uh, over the last few years, let's see, starting in 2015, we began collecting biosamples from people who are enrolled in the Natural History Database. So at a subset of the clinics, um, we're collecting blood for plasma, DNA, um, white blood cell for um, you know, potential biomarker discovery or understanding how the disease um, progresses uh, from person to person. And we've also been collecting samples from our TSC Clinical Research Consortium. So NIH-funded studies that are run through the consortium, the TS Alliance is collecting the biosamples and that becomes part of our biorepository as well. So we have over a thousand samples. So, um, you know, why are we interested in sharing data broadly? Why do we think it's important to, to share? And you'll hear some common themes, I think, from the last uh, couple of presenters. So, I mean, you know, fundamentally, we want more brains thinking about these data. It, it doesn't really help if the data are um, stuck, locked in one place, and not very many people have access. So in a general sense, that's um, one of the most important reasons. But uh, we also see the value, particularly with RDCA DAP, and um, finding potentially unanticipated connections to other diseases or to other treatments that could accelerate um, our understanding and hopefully our treatment of TSC. Um, sharing data helps increase awareness of TSC among both academic and industry researchers. Many folks uh, haven't heard of it. I hadn't heard of it until about a year uh, before I joined the organization. Um, and I think the same could be said for many rare diseases. Uh, people don't appreciate um, and certainly don't have a, a good way to remember the 7,000 diseases that are out there. So this is a way of getting it in front of people uh, with high quality data. Of course, we want to demonstrate um, impact and value to TS Alliance donors. It's the donors that have funded research and the collection of these data over many years. And it's important that we be able to share data so that we have that opportunity to, to, to demonstrate even more impact of the data. And of course, we hope that through this sharing, through this process, that it really leads to generate new hypotheses for avenues of research, whether that's um, funded by NIH or whether that's company funded research uh, in terms of clinical trials. But I think most importantly to sum it up, um, you know, we feel it's important to share broadly because the patients and the families have trusted the TS Alliance to utilize their data for the benefit of those living with TSC. And this is one important way that we can do it. So I will stop there and it's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Jeff Sherman, who's Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of Horizon Therapeutics. Jeff. All right, hopefully you can hear me. So Jeff Sherman, I'm the uh, Chief Medical Officer at Horizon Therapeutics. We're a biopharmaceutical company focused on drug development in rare diseases. Part of my uh, background as well is I also served as uh, chair of the board of the Drug Information Association, DIA, a not-for-profit that brings together government regulators, industry, academia, and patient groups to focus on facilitating uh, drug development, vaccine development, and a big focus as well in rare diseases. And it was really through that effort at DIA that I uh, was serving and continues to serve as the liaison to the FDA-supported clinical trial transformation initiative. And one of those uh, initiatives was looking at best practices in patient engagement. So as part of that, had an opportunity to work with Nord as well as uh, CPATH. And as you'll hear in a minute, uh, worked with Jane Larkindale as well. So 
Why are we here? You've heard uh, already that there's over 7,000 rare diseases, only 5% have an FDA approved treatment option, so a big gap. So rare diseases affect one in 10 Americans if you bring them all together. So a lot of unmet need here. There's small numbers of diagnosed patients with each rare disease, which makes deep data sharing even more crucial. And that data sharing will deepen our understanding of rare diseases and hopefully accelerate drug development. And this collaboration is critical and crucial if we're going to meet our goal of really filling that gap in terms of therapies for rare diseases. So the approach that Horizon has taken is uh, yeah, the groups that really know these diseases the most are really the patients who have these diseases. So we've worked across the board with not only what I would call umbrella groups, whether they're in Canada, Europe, certainly uh, the US and NORD's the preeminent organization, but also in the particular disease states that we're involved with, whether they're thyroid eye disease, uh, whether it's chronic refractory gout, uh, and one in particular that I'll go into more detail with is the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance. And FA is a incredibly debilitating, life-shortening disease for which there's still no FDA-approved therapy. Big unmet need. So Horizon partnered with FARA on the clinical development program of a product. And FARA, not only well-funded, but had done a lot of work in setting up a patient registry, as well as a long-term uh, registry to look at the natural history of the disease. And it already had some FDA interactions on endpoints, et cetera, that really helped to accelerate what uh, was needed and it was a true collaboration and really started far before a study, actually with a pre-IND pre meeting, uh, protocol development, study implementation. And this study was able to not only meet its enrollment goal, uh, but without any patient screen failures. And although the study didn't meet its primary endpoint, we're able to share the results and make sure that FARA has access to the full database and have turned that now over uh, to this initiative to really make sure that, you know, not only the patients, uh, but future patients could hopefully benefit from this. And the data collection and sharing certainly allows the medical and patient communities opportunities to facilitate research. And it's really key that, you know, these collaborations are, are, are really put in place and that there's real-time sharing. And a lot of this comes, and you'll see a quote to the right from our chairman, president, and CEO, Tim Walbert, uh, who's been public about the fact that he himself has a uh, rare autoimmune disease. And, and certainly, you know, what we're looking to do as a company is to advance knowledge in the disease states we're uh, involved with and, and certainly a key part of that is data sharing. So with that, I will now turn it over to uh, our moderator for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, that was wonderful. It's always great to hear all, all of you talking, your enthusiasm for what we're doing. I would now like to introduce the moderator of the next panel, who's Kathleen McDonoghue, who's the acting director of the Office of New Drugs at FDA CEDA, and she is going to moderate this panel and the next pa panel. Katie, over to you. Jane, you gave me a big promotion. I'm uh, the, the I'm division director for rare diseases and medical genetics, not for all of them. Um, but I'm really glad to be here today uh, with the panel members, and I so enjoyed. Um, hearing some of your reasons for why you've chosen um, to participate in the panel, because I think it's important. And I just want to kind of recap some of that. Nuria talked about wanting to incentivize drug development. That seems to be a common theme across all of these, is, is wanting to do whatever we can to um, incentivize and, and speed up scientific interest in drug development for these rare diseases. Um, Steve, I thought that 
that you shared some really important considerations. You know, the um, the opportunity to observe connections with other rare diseases, sort of unexpected or serendipitous uh, scientific connections. Um, and Julie, you talked about harmonization with data sources from multiple sources and that the RDCA DAB can do that. And I think that's another really important capability that you shared. Um, and um, I think one question I wanted to have uh, addressed, and Julie, I don't know, I'm gonna start with you. And I'd be curious, um, if your son or if some of the other patients in the community, what did they think when you said, hey, I wanna do this? I'd really love to hear sort of how, how that messaging, um, uh, how that went. Sure, um, that's a great question. And I love that you asked it and that you're focused on, on the patients. So they, they live with this disease every day. And as I described when I spoke, it's a hard disease to live with. It's something, you know, the basic metabolism of their bodies doesn't work and they're constantly needing to regulate and measure what's going on with them. So there's nothing more important to them than having a medication that can treat their condition so that they can go through their daily lives doing what the rest of us just want, are able to do without thinking. And so when we brought up uh, that we were gonna participate and it was with uh, discussions with, with patients that, that we came to this decision, um, mm -hmm. it was one, they were really excited about it. And they wanted us to really move forward with it so because they they trust us as stewards of their data of their experiences because we've been doing that since 2005 uh in a way that really i think we we've, we've earned their trust so thanks thank you julie do any of the other panelists want to talk about that about sort of um how those conversations went with your communities in terms of the reasons why and the motivations and, and some of the concerns patients may have had? I could just add, I think for ours, it was, um, it was very easy. Uh, I, I think it was clear we could articulate why, you know, it was important. You already heard uh, some of that. Um, and really people are, uh, you know, it comes back to the, the last point I made on the slides. People are sharing the data to make a difference and to be used. And so um, that, that, that made it a very, a very easy conversation, um, and much more upside than, um, you know, any extremely limited uh, risk or potential downside. So we, we, it, was, it was pretty easy on our, on our part. Before I move on to our next question, anybody else want to chime in on that? Yeah, what, what I could add, uh, Katie, is that, you know, there's such an unmet need with these diseases that uh, just everyone would really like to pitch in and help in any way possible. I mean, these are terrible diseases. A lot of them are associated, as you've heard, with a lot of morbidity, you know, life shortening, et cetera. So whatever we can collectively do, because at the end of the day, we're all patients and, you know, it could be any one of us. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so for my next question, I wanna go a little bit more structured. Naria, we'll start with you, but I'd like for each of the panelists to share a little bit about how the process went, sort of lessons learned, you know, any concerns you had going in, any challenges you encountered during the process, how those were resolved. What would you want other patient groups to understand about, about how the process works? And so Naria, we'll start with you and then um, uh, we'll go to Julie next. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, I need to say that the entire process was incredibly easy and I was very surprised because I was expecting, at least from the NIH, that there were going to be a lot of administrative and tech transfer and IRB and ethical hurdles before I was able to share data. Uh, and in reality was that um, the process was very fast and easy and the, the language that was part of the RDC ADAP agreement was very similar to our consent. Uh, it was standard language, so uh, we, didn't, we didn't need to make any changes and our IRB approved it uh, very easily. So 
And I think there was a lot of communication between our tech transfer office and RDCA. And, and so literally it was a couple of calls and, um, and a couple of questions, and then we were able to sign the agreement. And the, so the, the lesson I would say is just make sure uh, for people that are interested in sharing data to make sure that the consents, if they obtain them, have a language that will allow them to share the identified data, because I think that makes the process really quick. And, and then the other thing, actually very easy interactive platform where you would just uh, upload the spreadsheets. So, I mean, overall, it was really very easy and, and pain free. Over to you, Julie, I guess. Okay. So, we were actually a really, really tough group uh, to negotiate with. And quite honestly, um, as the stewards of the data, we feel a great responsibility. And we wanted to have a level of control over what was shared and how it was shared. And we wanted a contract and we wanted to be able to sign it ourselves. So initially being one of the I am rare patient registries, um, you know, we were, were part of that group. And so the assumption was that we wouldn't need that kind of agreement. But when we asked for it, uh, both Nord and CPATH were very accommodating and we were able to create our own agreement with CPATH. And we are a small grassroots patient organization. So we have a lawyer, um, you know, who helps us pro bono, who went through it very carefully and there was some back and forth. And CPATH was extremely accommodating and agreeable in terms of setting, uh, setting those agreements. So, you know, we felt really good about the process, listened to by all, and um, it went well, but it was tough at, at certain points. Do you want to share, if you can, a little bit about what was difficult and how you overcame that? Because I think probably a lot of the folks listening in would like to hear that. Sure. Um, so, so first of all, we wanted to be able to sign something ourselves so that we had an agreement. So if anything ever went wrong, we could go back and have a say. Um, and then there were certain uh, levels that we could share with different groups and we could determine which groups we would share with. And so we wanted to start sort of conservatively. And so we agreed that we would share with the regulators first. Um, you know, we have some dreams that eventually we ourselves could be sort of at the center, the hub of just this kind of data harmonization with academics and biotechs in our space. So we sort of didn't want to give it all away, but by giving, we gave, uh, we gave a data set um, to, you know, and we could, and then we can give more and, and we'd love to give more, but we can kind of titrate it and see how it goes. Um, but I just want to say that CPATH was great to work with and Nord, and so it all worked out, but I'm just being honest here. So. Thank you, Julie. Um, yeah. And so next up is Steve. Do you want to share a little bit with us about your experience, about how it worked, any surprises in the process, lessons learned, things that you think similar groups might want to know? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so uh, we're relatively recent. It was just a few months ago when we signed. So we probably benefited from some of the discussion that went on. It was very um, painless. Um, the The agreement was, I thought, very well thought out and and balanced. Um, I've uh, I've been involved with some other data sharing agreements that were tended to be a lot more one sided, and this was like, if anything, it was sort of seemed one sided to us. Um, because as Jane said, you know, as she was speaking, they're not trying to um, take things away and um, add to the data and whatever, they're, they're looking to, to add value to what we've already collected. So I found it very, um, very easy. They were easy to talk about um, any concerns and questions to seek that win win uh, solution. I think our um, our piece was, you know, our, our informed consent was very broad, but it said that the, it, it, it completely assumed that the TS Alliance was the one approving data requests, right? So um, to, that was pretty easy to solve by involving us in any um, 
you know, a seat at the table for any requests that were specific. You know, they wanted the TSC set of data that we would be involved in that discussion so that we could be involved in approving that request. And that was sufficient to um, do a couple of things. One, fulfill the, the, you know, the language of our informed consent, but um, it also builds that connection. So um, if, a, if a researcher or a company is really interested in the TSC data set, um, it, it, we feel like they, they ought to be talking to us. They would want to be talking to us because we can provide the background on the data, how it was collected, et cetera. The, the data are completely de-identified. In fact, the dates are, are not in there. It's age, right, at certain time points. So there are no birth dates, no visit dates. And so I feel like we still have a lot to add to a, a researcher who wants to perhaps design a clinical trial and, and study, we can reach out to those people because we still, you know, we can connect the data that were shared, um, you know, to individuals and then reach out for potential participation in relevant clinical trials. So that's something they can't do on their own with the identified data and we can help with. So again, it seems like a win-win um, to have us in the loop and because CPATH uh, and NORD already had contemplated you know this this option for us to be part of the process uh, it made it pretty easy to to say yes um so since the data are still being cleaned up at this point uh because you know we we shared it and it was very easy to share um we might come up with more lessons learned later uh so <laughs> check back <laughs> in a few months but uh for now yeah pretty smooth thanks steve and Jeff, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your experience from the drug developer side. So uh, who who within your organization did you have to persuade? Who had um, objections or encountered challenges? And, and how, how did you resolve them? Um, how did this go with your legal department? How did it go um, with you know, potential investors and business considerations? I'd, really, I'd love to understand a little bit from your end about um, how this worked for you. Yeah, no, thanks, Katie. Um, what we did is actually in our discussions with uh, FARA, even before we started the study, it was really the intent at the end of the day, no matter how the study you know, worked out, that there would be data sharing. And then it actually turns out sort of some serendipity here. Uh, Ron Bartek, uh, who had founded FARA, is also a board member of NORD. So a lot of this was really thinking about what do we need to do to really advance this? Uh, whole process. And then I think as you heard from Steve, yeah, the consortium has made it pretty much turnkey and have worked out a number of the kinks. So, you know, we knew we were going to be dealing with the identified data here. Uh, it was really more of what format did the data need to be set up in, in order to facilitate the transfer. Um, and, and what I would really say is that for this uh, to really facilitate this effort as it continues to be rolled out is to really encourage everyone to plan with the end in mind, which is, yes, certainly everyone would like a positive study and have a submission and keep you and your colleagues at FDA, you know, occupied with hopefully a lot of drug approvals to meet that mm -hmm. gap. But in all seriousness, it, it's really looking at we should all plan for this. And it's not just a you know, one and done relationship, it's really got to be looked at as a long term relationship with the goal at the end is hopefully, you know, whether a study is positive or not, being able to really share that information. Because again, with a lot of these disease states, as you know, I mean, we're dealing with very small numbers and anything that can get done to enrich the knowledge in the area is really key. So yeah, with our commitment to rare disease, it wasn't as much of an issue, but I think what you know may happen for others, if they don't really think about it early on, then, then it's a, oh my gosh, who do we need to get involved? And it could be scurrying around the organization, as you said, to find the right people you know, to make a decision to be able to sign off on it. But I think that as you know the consortium gets more and more experience they'll have seen and experienced not only what works what doesn't work but again i would just encourage to really build this in as early as possible to make it as easy as possible for everyone to be involved and share their data from studies 
Thanks, Jeff. And one follow-up question for you. Um, you know, I, from a drug developer's point of view, what do you see as the value and the potential from this platform? Uh, let's say we are going to get involved in a new area. You know, what's really invaluable is that there's a very rich data set that we're not recreating the wheel here or have to go out and try and find what are the data sources, how best to format them, et cetera. I mean, I think it makes it easier on everyone that's involved in the whole process. Uh, yeah, because yeah, from a patient perspective, I really look at it is every day we can save getting something to a finish line means, you know, less morbidity, hopefully longer lifespan. I mean, this is very real for everyone involved. Um, and so that's why, you know, in the city initiative, we called it, you know, return on engagement because there's very, very key savings that benefits all of us, public health and, you know, everyone's well-being. So I think it's really critical to really have access to these data sets because, you know, there are some patient groups that are very well developed. You've heard from a number of them on this panel, uh, but there's others that may just be getting started. And so it really behooves us all to have access to this type of information. Thank you, Jeff. That's really helpful. So I just want to um, thank our panelists. This was a, a really helpful and informative discussion. Um, and we're going to shift gears now and start with the question and answer. Jane, did you want to chime in? No, I think I may not be added to the, to the panel, but to go ahead. OK. I want so, to say thank you for the panel. They were fantastic. Um, so I saw a couple questions come in that were a bit more technical in nature. They may or may not be, um, and I'm not sure that our panelists are gonna be able to address them, but I'll throw them out there in hopes that maybe they can. So if you have had experience with these and you wanna chime in, please do. So there was a question about um, incorporating data from patients in the European Union and the GDPR requirements. Um, and there was another question about imaging data. And so do any of our panelists have any direct experience with either of those two challenges in terms of data sharing? Um, and if so, please chime in and share your experience. So I uh, have had experience certainly on the imaging side. So, you know, again, a key consideration there is what we've talked about, the, the identification of data. The other is if uh, imaging is going to get incorporated in the study, it's really to try and standardize that, as you know. And typically, uh, if it's really going to be used as an endpoint, really have a separate imaging uh, group that really looks at that. And so there should already be a database of the, the identified and imaging data as well. Thanks, Jeff. Maybe I can address the GDPR question, at least to some degree, because mm -hmm. I think many of us who are involved with data sharing have run into issues with GDPR, which I think un unintentionally as a law has made sharing of data somewhat more challenging. Um, there are certain levels of anonymization that in most cases, GDPR will allow data sharing. The question is, when it comes to rare disease data, is if you get to that level of anonymization, whether you have any useful data left. Um, and this is something we're working through. Our new analytics platform is actually going to be based in a GDPR compliant com country. This was very important to us to make it easier to access data from the European Union. Um, and it will meet GDPR requirements. So we hope that will make it easier to share data. Different countries and different hospitals interpret GDPR somewhat differently. We have successfully shared data from Europe before. I think by having the database in Europe is going to make that considerably easier. And the lawyers are currently working, working around some language in the data sharing agreement to make that easier and to make sure the data is suitably anonymized to meet the requirements. So I can't give you a full answer yet, except that we are really working on it right now. Thanks, Jane. 
Yeah, and for um, the implementer, GDPR are the, the European sort of data um, privacy regulations, um, and they're they're quite um, uh, they're, they're, they're quite aggressive um, in protecting in protecting patients' data. So, other panelists, any experiences with you know European Union records or with imaging data that you would want to share? I can okay. give a little bit of uh, imaging data, even though that's not something that we uh, share. Uh, we have used, uh, the imaging came from a single center, so it wasn't as complicated, but we found a program. Um, it, it's kind of a uh, data access that you can share whether just the images from an MRI can be viewed, de-identified by other uh, investigators at other sites. Uh, and for, um, you know, spectroscopy data, we were able to make outputs into into kind of like the spreadsheets that could be update uploaded into into a database, and so I think it really depends on what type of imaging data they're trying to to share. But uh, I think there are a, a variety of different um, ways of doing that, and I'm actually not sure whether RDCA DAP um, supports those. So I would be interested to hear about that. I Again, I can just jump in, jump in briefly that we are anticipating supporting imaging data through our CPATH, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's consortia at the moment. We have not started bringing in actual raw imaging images into IDCA DAP yet, but that's certainly on the cards for the next year or so. Um, recognizing the challenges of standardization across platforms and different people and different diseases and everything else. So we're doing some pioneering work um, across some of our other existing consortia and then we'll start looking at it with RDCA DAP hopefully in the next year. Thank you, Jane. So one of the um, other questions we got is what do you, um, or what have you experienced as the biggest barriers to data sharing? Um, and so I'd really love to hear from our panelists about that. Daria, do you mind starting us off? We can go in order. Sorry to put you on the spot. Absolutely. So um, I think the like like uh, several of the panelists were describing. Um, sometimes the biggest uh, issues may be you know how the data will be used and what type of data you're sharing and whether the patients from who you collected the data uh, wanna understand and wanna make that data available. Um, because we knew we wanted all of our data to become available at some point, when we consented each one of our patients, we went through the entire process of explaining what type of data is shared, you know, how is it de-identified so it cannot be tracked down back to them, uh, you know, that we would only share it uh, with a community that's, uh, you know, trying to advance uh, the knowledge of the disease or the science or clinical trials. And, um, and we gave patients the option to mark whether they wanted to share all of the data or just some of the data, for example, not include genetic data and whether they didn't wanna share the data at all. And so I think once we did that and we were ready to share, um, I feel like we, we, we uh, started working towards those challenges from the beginning, which made it a little easier. Um, yeah. And Julie, do you want to come on? Now? Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. So our registry, oh. the purpose, the purpose of our registry is is perfectly aligned with the RDCA DAP project. And so when the patients consented to be part of our HI Global Registry, they consented to be part of a project like this. So there was that really, really good kind of alignment there and our our those who participate in our registry they set their own levels of participation kind of in the same way they decide which surveys they want to participate in which questions they want to answer and so it's really up to them they've they've set their um their own level of participation in the registry so the, the patients are not really a barrier. With us, when I think about harmonizing with other sources of data, and I think about academics and the biotech communities, and um, that will really bring a richness to the data when the others in our community 
share data. And, and I do see some potential barriers because they all have their institutional, uh, their, their institutional goals, their institutional, um, you know, their, their focus on their own institution, on their own research, on kind of owning their research. And then there are often, um, you know, issues we're, we're talking about biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies that are they're, they 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 have of course they want new treatments and cures but they're businesses and so there's a level of realism here that I think that we all have to grapple with which is people promote you know who are interested in their own careers and 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 that's a real thing we're all human and we all care about those things so overcoming that and putting the patient first can be difficult so anything we can do to make those barriers kind of um you know make them go away so that it's easier to share um is better and and it's something that we have to grapple with as we learn how to share this is all new for us so Thanks, Julie. Um, Steve, do you want to comment? Yeah, I, so I can second what's been said, but then I'll, so I'll throw in something that's a little bit different, which is um, one of the challenges in sharing data is explaining how it was collected and the caveats associated with that collection. Um, so for example, our, our data are collected at 18 different clinics around the country, so they're not geographically representative, right? They don't capture everything. They may be biased towards people who are oh, somewhat on the more severe, severe spectrum. spectrum. I'm getting I'm feedback, feedback from, from someone. someone. Yeah, but um, so yeah, that's better. So um, yeah, so there are there are always, you know, caveats with sort of the way that that the data are collected and we feel like that's one of our our primary roles uh, is we have a steering committee of it includes clinicians it includes um, parents or patients um, who evaluate the research requests from our natural history database and one of the most important things they do is just a reality check of if this is the question that they want to ask are the data suitable for that or is the answer well no if they analyze our data set because it, it's not it's not going to be a, a valid um, you know way to ask that question and that that helps with the conversation so um, again by having us in the loop I think that that helps address that concern but it's mm -hmm. it's one that's really hard to get around because no amount of like metadata is necessarily going to adequately explain that um, yeah uh, thank you for that Jack did you want to chime in yeah, I think you've heard that yeah, question number one is always what's going to get done with the data? And then two, is this any possible way, and this gets to the de-identification, could be used <clears throat> in a deleterious way that could affect, let's say, insurance coverage, et cetera. I mean, you know, really thinking about it from a patient perspective who may or may not have been involved in doing clinical trials before or, or the whole process. So again, I, I really go back to the importance of really building all of this in at the very start. Uh, you know, it's almost to reassure everyone, but it's also to give them a real sense of transparency as well in terms of this whole process. Thanks, Jeff. So we're uh, down to the last few minutes. There's one more question I wanted us to tackle. Um, uh, the question is, we're currently developing the first survey for our patient registry rollout. Should we start working with someone now rather than after the data is collected to ensure we are collecting data in proper format? Um, so do I have one or two folks who want to chime in on that? A a absolutely. Okay. It's, uh, you know, the worst thing is you spend a lot of time and effort collecting data only to find that there's real gaps and then have to go back or whatever to rework it. It's just, you know, incredibly important to really think about the end in mind, to really preempt a lot of what you've heard from this panel, to really make sure that with all this effort and, and you know, and, and this is uh, a, 
a burden for you know, patients, their caregivers who have terrible underlying diseases. And we're asking a lot of them and we want to make this hopefully as facile as possible for everyone involved. Thanks, Chuck. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. I think thinking ahead, beginning with the end in mind and thinking about consent and data sharing, thinking about what kinds of data our drug developers going to need um, uh, in order to design a trial, um, you know, and, and, and sort of anticipating the format, the technical pieces for those data as well, I think are three really key considerations uh, at the front end. But, you know, part of why the FDA partnered with NORD and the RDC and, and CPAC was because we don't think patient groups should have to figure this all out for themselves. So the whole point of, of launching this was really to provide an infrastructure that patient groups could use to generate some top quality data in order to support drug development. So I just want to thank all of our panelists um, you know, for your sharing your experience, for your courage and being early adopters. Um, and, and for sharing with us some of your lessons learned. I've learned a lot during our conversation. I'm really excited to see the growth and the progress. Um, and uh, and I, I look forward to learning together with you what comes out of, out of all of, our, of your efforts. So thank you everyone.